Welcome to our second lecture covering ERISA and related healthcare laws that affect employees. Uh, when we were last together, we did a general introduction to ERISA and we were discussing employer requirements, especially the fact that the employer, at least the plan administrator, is a fiduciary of the ERISA plan. So let's go to that fiduciary material and look at the LaRue case briefly. Again, here are the, um, there's a definition of fiduciary, someone who has discretionary authority over an investment or management of plan assets on behalf of others. So the fiduciary is looking out not for himself or herself, but for the beneficiaries of the plan. And these are the characteristics that a fiduciary must have. Loyalty to the individuals who are the beneficiaries. The exclusive purpose of the plan is to benefit the beneficiaries. Uh, there has to be prudence. It's not just you have the best intentions, but you're actually doing sensible stuff. And one of those sensible things is diversification, not putting all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And of course, you have to follow what the documents say, the SPD and the underlying plan documents. So let's consider the LaRue case. The issue here is may an individual plan participant sue ERISA plan administrators, again, the fiduciaries, for breach of fiduciary duties for failing to follow the participant's investment instructions? And the answer is yes. In this case, LaRue was a plan participant and he says that the fiduciaries failed to follow his instruction to sell some securities in his retirement account. And this failure to follow his instructions resulted in him losing $150,000. Well, the plan managers, the administrators came back and they didn't dispute uh, what LaRue said happened, but what they said is LaRue doesn't have a basis for suing the plan administrators um, under ERISA. Um, and so this is what went up to the courts and uh, Mr. LaRue won. He, they, the Supreme Court said, while ERISA did not provide a remedy for individual injuries, ERISA does authorize recovery for fiduciary breaches that impair the value of plan assets. So for that reason, the court held that a plan participant can sue a plan administrator for breach of fiduciary duties to the participant. You don't need to know the name of this case or this holding, but this does chip away a little bit at the idea that plan participants are stuck, that they can't sue the, the ERISA plan. Obviously, as we talked about in the last lecture, there has to be an appeals process. Uh, there are, there are uh, bells and whistles plans have to have, uh, but it's relatively hard for the plan participants to actually sue an ERISA plan. But there are circumstances in which that is possible. Here we have the OEA case again. I'm not going to click on this link, but this link right here will take you to this case. You can see that we have here, again, all the neat things that we've seen before, brief discussion of the facts, the issues presented, and um, we can see it was a unanimous decision. And again, if you want to hear the um, opinion announcement right here, um, you can see you can hear it in less than two minutes. So I encourage you to go ahead and listen to that so you can get a flavor about what the court was thinking about. We have another case here, Metropolitan Life, MetLife. Um, does the an ERISA plan administrator have a conflict of interest when it evaluates and pays claims in making discretionary benefit determinations? So here it's kind of wearing two hats. It's paying the claims and it's deciding whether the claims need to be paid. So you can imagine uh, if you have to actually pay the claims, you may well decide that claim doesn't need to be paid, right? There seems to be a conflict of interest in that situation. The court agreed. The court concluded that because MetLife had both determined eligibility for benefits and paid benefits, it had an irreconcilable conflict of interest. It was in its interest not to find eligibility for benefits because that meant it was going to have to pay benefits. And in this case, the Supreme Court did hold that MetLife had abused its discretion denying benefits to Glenn. Again, you don't need to know the name of this this case or it's holding, but we have this OYA summary again. Let's go over here. Again, we're going to have the facts of the case, the question presented, and then what the answer is. This was not a unanimous decision. Justice Breyer issued the decision, and we can see here we again have an announcement. This one's a little bit longer, but still under six minutes, so not a huge investment of your time. I encourage you to watch these. They're, they're rather entertaining, actually. 
Um, so that is the MET case. So what does um, ERISA require? Well, we're gonna, we, we've kind of talked about a series of things that ERISA requires, but one of those things is that the employer cannot refrain from it, cannot uh, interfere with or retaliate against employees for exercising their rights under ERISA. This is a 510 issue, section 510. We'll show you that in a few minutes. So here's the statement, ERISA prohibits discrimination against a beneficiary. Again, that's a planned participant, typically the employee and a family member and or a family member of the employee for exercising any benefit right to which he or she is entitled to or which he or she may become entitled to. So this applies to both pension plans and welfare plans. So imagine that I am about to become eligible for a larger pension benefit on X date. Let's say I become eligible on March 7th. Well, if my employer fires me on March 5th, um, for, and the reason that it fires me is so that I don't get those pension benefits or those health insurance benefits or whatever those benefits might be, then very likely I have a 510 claim of discrimination or retaliation. But it's pretty limited. I have to be fired for the express purpose of defeating those rights. So it does present some evidentiary problems for the employer because most of the time, excuse me, for the employee, because most of the time the employer is not going to go around saying, we're firing you because we don't want you to have these goodies. Um, now, obviously, a very narrow time frame, if you know if the benefits accrue on the 7th and you're fired on the 5th, that's pretty suspicious, especially when uh, you know, your, your dismissal was not part of a larger reduction in force or you weren't caught doing something that was wrong or something along those lines. Um, so here's the rule. Employers must not discharge or discriminate against employees because they have used benefits to which they are entitled or to prevent them from using benefits to which they are entitled. So imagine that um, I marry somebody who uh, needs a significant medical uh, intervention. Well, the employer, uh, under the terms of the, of the uh, benefits of this particular employer, my spouse is entitled to coverage. Well, if they turn around and fire me because they don't want to pay for those benefits, that would be a situation which would be discriminatory. Again, here we're not talking about race discrimination or sex discrimination or any of those categories. We're talking about discriminating against somebody because if someone has used benefits or is entitled to use benefits or may use benefits in the future. So it's a very different idea of discrimination. Now we're gonna talk about pensions. Again, pensions continues to be an ERISA issue. So um, pensions are a little bit different than our health, um, uh, welfare benefits that we've been talking about because pension benefits are things that typically people don't participate in until their employment ends. And it's something that typically is in the distant future when the employment relationship begins. I mean, anybody can need health insurance, right? You can be a 22-year-old and be in a car accident. You need health insurance. You may be more likely to use health insurance as you get older, but certainly you can use it at any point in your life. But of course, retirement benefits or pension benefits are designed for people uh, typically 65 or older, maybe 55, but you know, usually not younger than those types of categories. So an issue that applies to pensions that doesn't apply to health insurance benefits is the idea of vesting. And here's a definition. Again, I encourage you to add this to your Quizlet. Vesting means being, becoming legally entitled to receive a benefit that cannot be forfeited if employment is terminated. So if my rights become vested, even if my employment ends, I'm still entitled to those rights. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm getting the maximum benefit of pension that I may get. My pension benefit is almost certainly going to increase with every year that I'm with the employer. But what it means is whatever rights I've acquired on that date, I can't lose. So if I'm entitled to $100 pension a month when I turn 65, let's say I'm 40 at this point, and I'm entitled to, under the company's programs, $100 a month when I hit 65 and I'm vested, then those $100 are going to be mine no matter what happens. I can quit tomorrow or I can stay for another 20 years. Now, of course, if I choose to stay for 20, 20 more years, very likely I'm going to get more than the $100 benefit. The benefit is going to continue to increase. And typically, once you get vested, every increase from that point will also be vested. 
Employers can require one year of employment to be in order before the employee can be eligible for participation in a pension plan. Um, so it doesn't necessarily follow that it's going to be instantaneous. So your vesting period may be a year. Okay, let's consider this scenario. Bob is a 22 year old delivery truck driver and he has been excluded from the pension plan in spite of working continuously for the company for the past six months. Under these facts, Bob's exclusion is legal because again, it's only six months and the law permits it for one year. So Bob does not have a legal complaint. ERISA does have an anti-cutback rule. And again, this rule prohibits employers. So again, add this to Quizlet. This rule prohibits employers from making changes to pension plans that reduce benefits already accrued by employees. Now, benefits can be reduced for folks who are not yet employees or are not yet vested in the program. So imagine that I've been with the company 10 years and I'm entitled to a $300 pension. The company can't reduce my pension to $250, but let's say Sarah gets hired the, the next day. Well, she could be offered a pension that's only $200 or whatever. She doesn't have to be offered my pension. The idea is that I've made career choices based upon the fact that I was gonna be getting this pension. And so I, it can't be changed with respect to my circumstances, but Sarah has never worked here before. She hasn't decided to work here yet. So um, she can make decisions based upon this new information. But in some sense, it's too late for me. I can't go back in time and go to work for another company that had a better pension plan. Pension plans can be modified or discontinued, but plan participants must be able to retain benefits that have already been accrued. So again, if I'm entitled to $200 in pension, a month on pension benefits when say 65 and I'm 40 today, I've got that $200 in my back pocket. Uh, I may not get increased amount, but I'm entitled to that right now. Also, ERISA, and this isn't just for pension, but for also health insurance and benefits like that. Um, ERISA requires that employers broadly cover their workforce. It doesn't mean every single employee has to be covered, but broadly employees, uh, especially full-time employees do need to be covered. And again, this is intended so that employers don't just give the really awesome benefits to um, their most highly paid or uh, em employees. Um, now, it is possible for an employer to have more than one plan and not all plans are ERISA plans. So an employer might have an ERISA plan that applies broadly to the population of workers and then have a separate plan that is not an ERISA plan just for highly compensated workers. The second plan, the non-ERISA plan, won't enjoy the tax benefits that the ERISA plan has. So it's very likely that the highly compensated employees will still participate in the ERISA plan. The second plan will just be an additional supplemental plan. And there's nothing unlawful about that at all. It's just a very common strategy for employers to have. So we have some more vocabulary terms to add to Quizlet. An employee benefit plan. This is a contractual obligation by which an employer or an employee organization, this could be, for example, a union, agrees to provide retirement benefits or welfare benefits. Again, example of this would be uh, health insurance to employees and their dependents and beneficiaries. So that's what we call that package. Retirement or pension plan, you probably see where this is going. It's a plan, again, it can be from the employer or an employee organization like a union that provides for compensation at retirement or deferral of income in periods beyond termination of employment. Okay, now these two terms are gonna be important. We're gonna talk more about these in the next few slides, but let's get introduced to them. What is a defined contribution? So we can see we have defined contribution, defined benefits. So a contribution is focusing upon what the employee is contributing. So a retirement plan where the benefit payable to a participant, again, think employee, are based upon the amount of contributions and earnings on such contributions. So these are the contributions of the employee. This is gonna be a 401k situation. If an employee chooses not to participate in the defined contribution plan, 
he or she's not going to get any benefit. If he or she makes small contributions, then he or she's going to get a small benefit. If he or she makes large contributions, he or she's going to make a large benefit. It's all going to turn upon the choices that the employee makes and not just the amount of contributions the employee chooses to make, but also typically the investment choices within those programs that the employee makes. Then we have a defined benefit plan. This is a much better option for employees. Employers love this choice. Employees love this choice. Some employers have both, but there's definitely a trend away from defined benefit to defined contribution. So what is a defined benefit plan? It's a requirement plan. Again, it's a plan that is either created by the employer or by, again, a union or some other employee organization. So it's a retirement plan where the benefit payable to a participant is defined up front by a formula, the funding of which is determined actuarially. So the employee, I mean, in theory, an employee could be contributing to this, but typically the employer is contributing to this. And so it's, for example, based upon well, it, it works very much like Social Security. You know, you work a certain number of, of years at a certain pay rate, and then you're going to get this benefit. Um, even if the market tanks, you're still entitled to this benefit. But if the market soars, your benefit isn't going to be higher. So the employer is bearing the risk of an unstable market with a defined benefit program. A defined contribution program, the employee is bearing that risk. And here we have these same definitions. So in a defined benefit plan, the employer assumes the risk. Because the employer has more opportunities to mess things up by doing risky things, say with the uh, uh, monies that are in this plan, the uh, government will in, uh, scrutinize these much more carefully. The security is for the employee uh, because he or she is going to know exactly what he or she is going to be paid on a monthly basis upon retirement. And this is favored by employees because of the certainty. A defined contribution plan is just the reverse. The employee bears the risk. And you can see how uh, because it's not defined, the employee isn't sure what he or she is going to get. I mean, if you know the stock market mark stock market crashes the day after he or she retires, well, the, likely the value of the defined contribution plan will also crash and the employee might receive less money. On the other hand, if the market soars, the employee is going to get more money. So the employee bears the risk and you can see why it's more popular with the employers than with employees. This is the 401k type option. Um, so this is how our benefit, again, this is a Quizlet term, uh, how our benefits are protected. You know, sometimes companies go bankrupt. Uh, for example, uh, my employer, JCPenney, ha has filed for bankruptcy. Um, I have a pension through JCPenney. Was I worried? Not even a little bit, because I know the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, a PBGC, which is a government corporation, um, it will protect my benefit. Even if JCPenney can't pay the benefits that it's promised to me, it's been paying premiums, it's been required to, um, so that if it can't pay that, just like any other type of insurance product, I will get paid through the PBGC. So the PBGC protects beneficiaries of defined benefit plans. So this is protecting people in this universe. The people that have a guarantee and again, this is why there's greater scrutiny. When their employers are unable to meet the obligations. So you may sometimes hear on the news, well, that pension fund is underfunded or overfunded or something like that. If it's underfunded, this is not a good thing. Um, it means there isn't enough money to pay all the people that will eventually need to get benefits. Employers with defined benefit plans are required to purchase insurance from the PBGC. And again, there's a Pension Protection Act that requires fi finan sound financial practices for pensions, rules of the road that they need to follow uh, so, that they, uh, so that their retirees will be able to uh, get the benefits that they have worked so hard for. So now we're going to talk about defined contribution plans. So this relates to define, uh, define benefit plans, this one. Now we're going to talk about defined contribution plans, the 401k, so to speak. 
401ks, that's probably the big one, profit sharing plans, stock bonus plans, and ESOPs, which are employee stock ownership plans. So what is a 401k? So I would consider all of this a good definition. So for Quizlet, add this, you don't need to have the link. The 401k refers to the relevant section of the Internal Revenue Code. I'll show that to you in just a second. It is the most popular type of retirement plan in current use. And typically the plan allows eligible employees to make pre-tax elective deferrals of their wages through payroll deductions. So the magic sauce here is that the employees don't have to pay taxes on these monies before it goes into their uh, 401k. And the idea is when they start deducting or withdrawing money from it, they'll be in a lower tax bracket because they will no longer be earning a, a, a wages, they'll be retired. And so it will be at a, a relatively lower tax rate. Most 401ks are salary reduction plans. So the employer uh, makes a withdrawal, let's say a particular employee earns $1,000 in a particular pay period. And let's say this a particular employee has decided to contribute 12% or withdraw 12% of his earnings into a 401k. Well, and let's say this is the net amount with, with after all the taxes and other things, or actually before taxes. So let me, that's wrong, I shouldn't have said that. So now we're gonna do, we're gonna remove 12% of this and so now instead of this person earning $1,000, the person actually earns um, 880. And this is the amount that's taxed. Well, you can see that, you know, this is obviously the tax bill is obviously going to be significantly less for this person after the, these deductions have occurred. Now, the, this money that is socked away is hopefully going to grow in the 401k and eventually it will be taxable. But at that point, this worker probably won't be earning $1,000 during whatever time period this is. Now, what people can invest in a 401k is usually things like a common stock, bonds, um, uh, uh, mutual funds, things along those lines. Uh, what is offered can vary from company to company. There's lots of business out there like Fidelity that uh, have various products that people can invest in. And of course, people who make poor decisions are gonna maybe lose their money or not get as high a rate of return as they can. It really depends upon the wisdom of the person making those choices. So let's say that I happen to have a 401k plan and um, I get into some financial difficulty and I need to file for bankruptcy. Well, my 401k monies are generally going to be safe from the bankruptcy court and that account isn't going to be liquidated. If I leave one employer, typically I can leave my 401k with that employer or I can carry it over, roll it over is the term that is used. If I roll it over the correct way, I'm not, it's not a taxable incident. So I can move it from my employer maybe to a mutual fund company or perhaps to my next employer. If I don't roll it over right though, I can, if I do it wrong, I can accidentally have a big taxing event. The employee has to make, has to start making withdrawals on the 20, uh, April 1st of the calendar year when he or she reaches the age of 70 and a half, unless the employee is still employed at the company that's sponsoring the 401k. So you can see the idea is, if you're this old, you ought to start being, you know, enjoying this money and again, from the IRS perspective, paying taxes on it, right? Um, I don't have this term in, in red, uh, but this is a more simple version of a 401k you can see by the name. This is for small businesses. Again, it's for uh, businesses that have 100 or fewer employees. So it's a stripped down 401k type plan. Um, I'm gonna pause here and show you the statute for 401k. Sometimes people are like, where, where do we get the name 401k? It's, oh, I'm sorry, I should have shown you. This is 510, um, section 510. This is that no retaliation thing that we were talking about before. 
uh, the, the statute, it shall be unlawful for any person to discharge, fine, suspend, expel, discipline, or discriminate against a participant or beneficiary for exercising any, rich, any right to which he's entitled under the provisions of an employee benefit plan, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's look at 401k. So we go to the tax code. The tax code is uh, uh, Title 26, and you can see here Title 26 is the Internal Revenue Code, and we're in Section 401. Now this is an interesting thing. If you haven't played much with statutes, I'm going to show you a little bit about how they work. So you can see you, you first of all start with your title number, and then you have your section number. And now after the number here, we're going to have a letter, a lowercase letter, and this pattern follows throughout all statutes. And we know we're looking for 401k. Well, obviously it starts with an A. So we know we need to find B, C, D, all the way to K. Um, but under A, it doesn't go directly from A to B because there's more granularity under A. So after lowercase a, then you're going to have numbers 1 and 2 and 3, et cetera, et cetera. And things can even get more granular. You can see under 5, we have capital letters, A, B, C. And you can even see under capital letters, you can have um, I, I, I. And under I, you can even see Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two. So there's, it's, it's almost like a, 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 what do you call it? An outline that you might've done in English class or whatever. So this D isn't, at the same level of the A, we're need, going to need to look for a lowercase b as in boy to get to our next point. So we haven't yet seen it. And it can go on for pages and pages until we see it. You can see it, we're under category nine under A. And now we have all these capital letters, D, E, F, G, H, I, and now we finally get to 10, but we're still under uh, A. Now we're to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Still not to be yet. Right to 28 now, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. Finally got to be, we're several, several pages into this. And again, it's the same pattern. You start with B, then we have numbers one and two, but this section's much shorter. Sometimes you'll have super long ones, sometimes you'll have super short ones. Then we get to C. Again, same pattern, we'll have a number, and again, it can be more granular under the number. We go from one to two, three, four, five, six. Oh, we're already to D. E was repealed, so we don't even have E. Now we go to F. Again, after F, we have regular numbers. Very short, we get to G, we get to H. We have the numbers under here, we get to I. Of course, we're going to K, so we don't have much farther to go. We have one, two, three, J is repealed, and here we are at K. So this, so when you hear people talk about 401Ks, they are literally talking about this. So we go until we get to L. Yeah. 
So all the way down here. So everything that is that I have highlighted is the 401k section, the statute about it. So it's several, uh, several pages long. So here's the general rule though. A profit sharing or stock bonus plan, a pre-ERISA money purchase plan or a rural cooperative plan shall not be considered as not satisfying the requirements of subsection A. That was that first really long section. We're in K now, but this is A, the first one. Merely because the plan includes a qualified cash or deferral arrangement. And again, it goes through and talks about all the ins and outs of that. Very dense stuff, as you hopefully you can see. Tax statutes are very, very complicated. There's no light reading there. Now we're going to talk about the Keogh plans. Uh, Keogh was a congressman who, uh, this was one of his things that he was focused on. He's, I'm sure, gone to his reward. Uh, this is, I think, probably from the 70s. Uh, there's a G in it, but it's silent. It's just Keo. Um, these are available to self-employed persons and their employees, so very small companies. And it's kind of like a simple 401k, but even a more stripped down thing than that. Um, so you do are expected to know that. Let's just look at how we might approach that definition. Probably you'd want to point out that these are for small businesses. Pre-tax money placed in a KEO grows tax-free until the person withdraws the money. So that might be uh, enough to kind of get you the finish line in terms of your definition. Okay, so we were talking before with, I think, LaRue about the uh, fiduciary responsibility. And um, I hinted at it, I don't know if I said it directly, but that you know, the, the, generally speaking, the LaRue result is not tremendously common because there's a strong presumption of prudence that courts have uh, on the backs of fiduciaries in these particular cases. It's a pretty steep difficulty that the plan participants have to show, you know, because the idea is the courts say, look, we, you know, when the, uh, plan administrator was making the decisions, he or she didn't have a crystal ball. He or she couldn't have known what the stock market was going to do. We're not going to second guess them. We're not going to Monday morning quarterback them. Um, so uh, the Verity uh, Corporation versus How talks about what those standards are for administering pension and welfare plans. And this is again another a US Supreme Court case. Did the employer and its subsidiary act as ERISA fiduciaries when they deliberately misled the plan beneficiaries? In this case, we see, we'll see that the uh, employer did and there, thereby, because they deliberately misled, while they should have been acting as a fiduciary, they breached that fiduciary duty. Again, uh, you're not responsible for knowing the ins and outs of this. This is an important case. So if you actually become an ERISA paralegal or attorney, you're going to want to, you know, you, or you will be aware of how this, this works. The Supreme Court decided that the employer was acting as an ERISA fiduciary when it misled its employees, and the Supreme Court in, thereafter ruled in favor of the former employees. It held that reasonable employees could have assumed that the company was speaking both as an employer and a plan administrator. So you need to know this stuff and the answer over here. It is possible for the employer to be considered a planned fiduciary. Let's flip on over to the Verity case for just a second. And here we have it. Um, again, we can see that we have the facts of the case. Again, Breyer issued this decision Sometimes justices will kind of specialize in a particular area of the law. They may have specialized in it before they came to the court, or they may develop an interest in it while they're on the court. It looks like Breyer may have seen this as an area that was, he was particularly interested in, and so uh, several of the decisions are from him. And again, we have an um, uh, opinion announcement. This one's a little bit more complicated, in my opinion, 
uh, probably a little bit less entertaining than some of the other cases that we've talked about, but it's short, it's less than four minutes long. So I encourage you to give that a look-see as well. We've already talked about the summary plan description that employers must provide. I have a link to another one. I think I showed you Walmart's earlier. Here's a link to Amazon's. Um, in addition, the, uh, the each uh, uh, plan needs to uh, file an annual report with the Department of Labor. Uh, okay, a benefit plans 100% uh, non-forfeit, non-forfeitable uh, after three years of employment. Um, so this is uh, um, relating to the vesting rules for benefit plans. Now, if the plan is not a pension plan, employers do have the right to reduce or modify them. You can't reduce or modify a benefit that is already vested, that's a pension benefit. But it's perfectly fine for an employer, to, for example, to say, look, last year we were willing to pay three quarters of the cost of health insurance. This year, oh, wait a second, I guess I need to do a better pin color, don't I? So last year we paid three quarters, this year we're only willing to pay half. Now the employer can't switch in the middle of a, a year but for the next benefit year, however that's calculated. Another thing that employer can't do within an ERISA plan is have levels of benefits within that plan. As I said before, employer has the option of having supplemental plans that do provide greater benefits, but within the ERISA plan itself, the benefit needs to be the same. Now that doesn't mean that the actual payoff has to be the same. For example, you might have some equation that says, well, um, you know, 1% of your wages times however many years you worked get your benefit. Well, if you were earning $20,000 a year, your benefit's gonna be less than if you're earning $100,000 a year. But if the equation is the same, then that's okay. ERISA plant claims can sometimes be asserted under the Age Discrimination Employment Act. Um, and that, of course under the 510 is another mechanism. So now we're, we're done with ERISA. Of course, I've just given you a few hints and a few topics with respect to ERISA. It's a very complex law. I myself am not an ERISA practitioner, so I know a little bit about it, maybe a little bit more than a little bit, but I certainly am not an ERISA attorney by any stretch of the imagination. But it is a very um, interesting and rewarding area. It is probably the area of the law that provides the most work-life balance for the attorneys who practice in it. Um, it uh, is also a good field for paralegals to be involved in as well. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about HIPAA and very briefly on the Affordable Health Care Act. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accounting Act. And again, we'll be talking about these two statutes in this section. So here we have, I'm gonna to switch to a better marker here. So here's another uh, Quizlet term. HIPAA prohibits health, group health plans from denying benefits or charging more for coverage based upon any health factor. That is um, an important aspect of HIPAA. I think a lot of times people focus when they talk about, or people are more aware of the privacy aspects of HIPAA than the other protection aspects of HIPAA. Um, because usually, you know, most of us are exposed to HIPAA issues when we go to our doctor's office and we're required to sign some kind of HIPAA uh, acknowledgement. Uh, and, and certainly those are important, but they, uh, HIPAA is a broader statute than just that little bit. So again, um, we can't deny benefits or employers can't deny benefits or charge more based upon a health factor. So uh, an employer can't say, well, Sally, you've got cancer, so you're gonna pay double the premiums that Bob pays. Or Bob, you're 20 years older than Sally, so you're gonna pay higher benefits than what Sally pays. Can't do that. 
Um, HIPAA does allow for, or yeah, yeah, HIPAA as it was written allows for uh, there to be some pre-existing condition exclusions for some limited period of time, but the Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, which is oftentimes called Obamacare, uh, has now made those unlawful. Again, uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, is uh, an evolving situation. Uh, there have been challenges to it. There continue to be challenges to it. Uh, my guess is in the future, we'll see some changes to it, either because parts of it may be held to be unconstitutional, but even but whether that happens or not, there obviously the, there's the potential for the president and or Congress to make changes to the law. Um, some employers will have wellness programs. Uh, if you participate in the smoking cessation program or if you participate in this exercise or weight loss program, um, you may get some kind of reduction in your health insurance benefits. Well, usually those are unlawful under HIPAA because again, um, if I don't participate in it, then I'm paying more than somebody else. And so that sounds like a health factor that is distinguishing me from somebody else because uh, people who don't smoke don't have to participate in a smoking cessation program, obviously. So um, in some cases, wellness programs do need to be looked at very carefully to uh, make sure that they don't violate these non-discrimination requirements. There is also laws that require that there be parity for mental health conditions as well as physical health conditions. So for example, you can't treat somebody who has cancer better than somebody who has schizophrenia. They're both serious illnesses. They both require treatment. And um, an employer can't say, well, we like this particular disease better than that particular disease and make those distinctions. Those are unlawful. Let's consider this scenario. Mary has multiple cysts on her kidney. She has to undergo surgery. Two months after the diagnosis, she begins employment. And she has a three-month waiting period before new employees can enroll in the health insurance plan. If Mary enrolls in the insurance on the earliest date, she will be eligible because employers cannot exclude employees from insurance coverage due to pre-existing medical conditions. So if Mary can wait one more month, I'm sorry, let's see. So she can wait for those three months to be up before she has her surgery, then the surgery will be covered. Obviously, if she take, takes a surgery beforehand, she's not gonna be covered. So then she would have to either pay, pay for it out of her own pocket, or perhaps she's enjoying COBRA benefits from her previous employer, or perhaps she has insurance through her spouse's employment. Okay, so here is uh, the purposes of HIPAA to protect health insurance coverage for workers and their families upon change in or loss of employment and requiring that health insurance care providers uh, health insurance plans, employers follow specific requirements in regard to security and privacy of health data. This is that thing we're all familiar with from going to the doctor's office. So HIPAA actually amended ERISA. So you would find HIPAA in the ERISA section. It's not important that you know that. They're all kind of intermingled because, uh, you know, Congress uh, passes a law, you know, ERISA was passed in, I think, 1973. HIPAA was passed in 1996. So what the Congress did was in, uh, uh, add additional things to the ERISA idea and in various portions of the statute. It's a very common thing to happen with statutes. So let's discuss briefly the privacy rule, because this is kind of what we, we think about when we think about HIPAA. So let's say that somehow or another your private health information is leaked. You aren't going to be able to bring any private lawsuit about the HIPAA violation. You may have some other claim that you can advance, but it won't be based upon HIPAA. Perhaps it'll be a state law claim, because there is no private cause of action under HIPAA. Now, states can have additional privacy laws, including tort claims or statutory laws, but there is no preemption under HIPAA. Even though HIPAA amended ERISA, and ERISA does have broad preemption aspects, HIPAA does not. As far as I know, obviously we in Texas have state tort claims available to us. 
I am not aware of state Texas state privacy laws other than the common law tort claims. I could be mistaken in this area. It's not an area of the login that I practiced in. So let's consider Mary's circumstance. So she's the chief administrator in charge of medical records at Collin County Hospital. She receives a request for copies of Bob's medical records from Bob's employers, employer. Well, Bob's employer only has a right to this information if Bob agrees to release it. Uh, but Mary doesn't wait for Bob to approve. She releases it to the employer uh, right away. Under this situation, Mary has violated HIPAA's privacy rule because Bob's employer is not included in the category of entities that can receive protected health information without authorization from Bob. So now we're gonna talk briefly about the Affordable Care Act. This was passed in 2010. It was one of the first things that President Obama did. And it was designed to make it easier for Americans who do not have health insurance through their employer to um, obtain and, and continue to have health insurance. It helped with pre-existing condition limitations and allowed people to have continuity of coverage. But it was very controversial for lots of reasons. It's a very complex situation. It was really focused on not only maintaining the health insurance of individuals, but also in containing some of the costs of health insurance, because as you most likely know, health insurance is a very expensive undertaking for an, an individual employee, as well as for the employer, when the employer pays a portion of it. And it's a very big part of our economy. So many parts have been challenged in court. Some parts have been struck down. Most parts have been upheld. But there continue to be challenges even over 10 years after the passage of this law. So we may well see changes in the future. For that reason, I'm not going to, well, also because it's not really tremendously relevant to our topic. But we can see, here's just some information again, I'm not going to test you over. But if you have some curiosity about uh, the Affordable Care Act, here are some of the specifics. And um, because the Affordable Care Act has almost certainly reduced the use of COBRA benefits. Um, there's no need to use COBRA the same way that there was once a need because again, um, people are eligible to jump into the um, uh, healthcare market um, in a way that was not as easy to do pre-Obamacare. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about COBRA. Again, you don't need to know the long name of it. All you need to know is COBRA. Long name doesn't really tell you what it's about. Um, here we go. So COBRA, here's our definition. COBRA requires employers to provide employees the option of continuing health insurance when qualifying events occur, which would terminate coverage. So this assumes, I mean, obviously if your employer doesn't offer health insurance, it's not required to offer COBRA. And even if it does offer health insurance, but that particular employee has not elected to take health insurance, there are no COBRA benefits. COBRA just kicks in when you have an employee who is getting health insurance through his or her employer and that employee leaves pretty much for any reason, resign, layoff, termination. There is a little bit of wiggle room where employers who actually fire an employee from serious misconduct can deny COBRA benefits. That's pretty rare though that, you know, even in cases of theft, I think most employers don't. I really look to that exception because COBRA benefits don't really uh, cost the employer any money. Uh, all of the benefits, you know, for example, let's let's say uh, a particular employee's insurance package costs a thousand dollars a month, and let's say in this particular employer uh, agrees to pay two thirds of it, so that employer is paying. $666 a month, the employee is paying $334 a month, we'll say. Well now, um, so this is what the employee is paying, this is what the employer is paying. Now the employee quits or is fired or whatever the scenario is. If the employee wants to continue with COBRA benefits, he has to pay both of these, the whole $1,000, but not just that. He also has to pay a 2% kind of administrative fee. So 2%, this is 20 bucks. So he would end up paying $1,020. You can see if you're out of work, 
that's probably a pretty significant investment for you to make. You may not have that kind of money available. Even if you're going directly to work for another employer, you're probably not going to want to do that for that long, even if the pay is good, because most likely you'll get insurance through another employer. I myself used COBRA benefits when I left Baker Botts, the law firm where I initially worked, to go work for um, uh, J.C. Penney. Because, you know, when I left Baker Botts, I had health insurance, but I think it was three months before I became eligible for JCPenney benefits. So during those three months, I needed to have some coverage, obviously. And so I used COBRA benefits for just that brief period of time. So let's consider what qualifying events are. Here we go. And this is another one, a term that you should add to Quizlet. So the termination of employment. Sometimes reduced hours of employment can also be a qualifying event if the reduction in hours causes the employee to lose benefit coverage. I'll give you another example. When I was at JCPenney, I uh, went to part-time status after my, my second child for a period of time. And so I did lose benefits because I was working uh, just a few hours a week for uh, several months. So in that situation, I also use COBRA benefits, even though my employment with JCPenney never ended during that time. I eventually returned to full-time status, but that's how that worked. Uh, for divorce or legal separation, this would apply to the spouse of the employee. So let's say Bob and Mary are married. Mary is the employee of the employer. Uh, Bob is getting insurance through Mary's employer. Bob and Mary divorce, well, Bob is entitled to receive uh, COBRA benefits under that situation. It's obviously his choice whether to take them or not. Now, if, Mary, if Bob hadn't been getting benefits through Mary's employer, then Bob would not have any COBRA benefits under that situation. Um, so that's how that works. Mary cannot continue Bob on her insurance after they are divorced. Now she can continue insuring her and Bob's children together, but not Bob um, if he is no longer her husband. If the employee dies, let's again go back to our story. This time Mary and Bob don't divorce, but Mary passes away. Well, then Bob would be eligible for COBRA benefits in that situation, as would Bob's children if they, are, if they were already under Mary's uh, um, insurance. So let's say Bob and Mary, whether they're married or divorced or whatever, um, have a child, Susan. When Susan uh, reaches the age of the plan where she is no longer eligible to participate in the plan, then she would be eligible to receive COBRA benefits for some period of time after it. Again, in all these cases, whether it's Bob or Mary or Susan, that person would have to pay 102% of the premiums. So these are the category of situations. Um, probably the ones that I care about you knowing most though are this one and these two. Okay, COBRA requires group health insurance sponsored by employees with 20 or more full-time employees in the prior year to offer employees the extension of health insurance. Again, this tracks with the ADEA, which has a threshold of 20 employees. The employer needs to provide certain notices to the employee upon um, his or her separation, or if it's a divorce or death situation, to provide that information to the former spouse. Um, in most cases, the a COBRA individuals, if they elect to continue the coverage, will have 18 months. Sometimes it's 36 months. I think it's 36 months in the case of divorce. But 18 months is the one that I'm going to ask that you know. So be aware of that particular time period. Obviously, if you're getting into the weeds, you would want to know when it's 18 or 36. But for our purposes, 18 is what I care about. Are you knowing about for this point in time? Um, so when an employee becomes eligible for Medicare, and typically that's around 65, uh, that's a government program that provides insurance for people who at a certain age, it's not necessary for that person to actually be retired to be eligible for Medicare benefits. And in that situation, employers have the opportunity 
to reduce that health insurance uh, because the employee is already entitled to Medicare. Um, and now we are up to our last topic. Yay, we've talked about ERISA, HIPAA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, and COBRA. We're going to talk briefly about the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act, OWBPA. Um, this is an amendment to the Age Discrimination Employment Act. I'm sure we've defined this before, but if, we, if you don't have a definition in Quizlet, please add it. It permits employee, actually this is a different aspect than we talked about before. You may recall when we talked about this statute before we were talking about the waiver requirements that are necessary if the um, employee intends to waive rights under the Age Discrimination Employment Act. Here we're talking about benefits protection. So this is actually um, a separate definition. You'll wanna have this one in your Quizlet as well as the other one. You certainly can combine both into one definition if you prefer. So what do we need to know about the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act? Well, it permits employers to provide less extensive coverage for older workers as long as the amount expended is equal to that spent on other workers. So here, obviously to provide $1,000 worth of protection to an 80 year old is gonna be more expensive than to a 60 year old. And so as long as the benefit, the amount that the employer is spending is the same, it's okay if the benefits are different. And again, this just applies to welfare plans, not to pension plans. A little reminder from our Americans Disabilities Act, employers may not consider the fact that a disabled person may be more expensive to insure than other employees. And of course, an employer can't deny that disabled employee insurance because of the disability. So this can, of course, result in a greater benefit bill for that particular employer and that can't be an undue hardship. Let's talk about quadros. This is a field that even if you choose not to do benefits work in your career, you may do family law and family law quadros are a big deal there too. So either practice area, you'll be seeing quadros. Quadros is an abbreviate or a way of saying a QDRO, but I've never heard actually anyone say QDRO. They, in my experience, always say quadro. And it stands for a Qualified Domestic, domestic Relations Order. And um, I'm, I'll probably have a better definition on another slide. So uh, please be sure to add this to Quizlet. But um, it, it, I, I guess, well, you could use this one, but you're going to want to rephrase it. So a quadro is a court order that assigns benefits or other, I see pension or other welfare benefits from one spouse to another incident to a divorce. Now, the reason that these court orders are noteworthy is that usually these types of benefits can't be severed. We already said before how they are not subject to uh, being uh, tapped in a bankruptcy case. The creditors can't get what's in the 401k. Um, and, uh, but, but one exception to that uh, non-severability rule is in the case of divorce. In that situation, as part of a final divorce decree, uh, the, the non-employee spouse can potentially get money that is in that 401k uh, package. So we are now done with all of our modules. Yay us. As I hope you've gotten a flavor for this, these are really complex things. They require specialists, ERISA attorneys and paralegals who really know this field. This is not a field that people dabble in, you know, do a little bit of ERISA work. No such thing has occurred ever. Um, it also involves a lot of accountants being in because many accountants are more are tax professionals as well. And so this is a very specialized area. It's important if you work in-house, say for a corporation, you may well be the client when you're working with ERISA people. So you may not be the person who's drafting the documents, but you may be the person who's providing information to the law firm or reviewing documents that the law firm has provided, even if you aren't a specialist in this area. Just recognize that it really does require a, a lot of very sophisticated knowledge to, to dot every I and cross every T. 
Employers need to be aware of where ERISA is, where COBRA is, where HIPAA is, what the changes are in these regulations, uh, where the Affordable Care Act is in terms of what portions are still in effect and what changes happen. This is an area of the law that I anticipate we will continue to see changes in. Uh, expansion of rights, maybe contraction and, uh, contraction of rights, and new rules about how employers need to handle this information. Well, I hope that this presentation has been helpful for you. As always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to pop into my office hours. I thank you so much for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.